Hello and welcome to the Two Degrees Podcast. I'm sitting here this week with Daniel Weeks, President of Americans for Campaign Reform. As an undergrad at Yale, he was founder of Students for Clean Elections and director of the Democracy Fund, PAC. He has been a director of Americans for Campaign Reform, New Hampshire Citizens Alliance, and New Haven Action, and is the recipient of a President's Public Service Fellowship. He worked for AmeriCorps and got a master's at Oxford, where he studied on a Marshall Scholarship. He's also a friend of mine from our time at Oxford. Welcome, Dan. Great to be here. Thanks, Ben. Now, next Friday marks an important anniversary. Why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, next Friday, 21st of January, is the one-year anniversary of a landmark Supreme Court decision. Um, I would argue, when the history books are written, that this will be considered up there with Brown v. Board of Education and, and some of the other really key decisions, because it change the course of, I think, political power in our country. Um, The court ruled in Citizens United v. FEC last year that corporations and unions uh, have the same constitutional rights under the First Amendment to spend unlimited amounts of money to influence political outcomes. Um, The court has traditionally held that individuals have this right, so you can't restrict a person's ability to spend whatever money they want, the Michael Bloomberg's of the world, to, to run for office. But when it comes to corporations, aggregations of wealth trying to influence politics, uh, they have traditionally not had this right to, to influence politics in this way. But the court, by a five to four vote, struck that down a year ago. And I think the 2010 election that we recently saw um, was a pretty good example of just, just how significant it is. Um, we had about $300 million in outside spending directly uh, trying to elect or defeat candidates. Um, about half of that money, well over $100 million, is totally undisclosed. Uh, so we don't know who is having this tremendous influence in, in who our elected leaders are and ultimately what decisions they're taking. Um, so we're very concerned, and I think Americans are more attuned to the issue than they have been in a long time. And uh, we're going to celebrate this anniversary by reminding people of, of just how badly we need to change the system of, of campaign finance in this country. So... Two Degrees Network is a platform for sustainability professionals. So I grant that some of our listeners may may be wondering, how does campaign reform relate to sustainability? There are two important issues, but they're often not talked about in the same breath. Um, However, your organization is one of the only ones I know that is talking about them in the same breath. Um, And I have to say, I'm convinced you know this, but some of our listeners may not be. So... Pretend that I'm one of your listeners. You have me here in the room. Convince me. Thanks, Ben. I'll I'll do my best. (laughs) Um, I I think one thing to begin with that we share in common, those trying to change the the campaign finance system, the political system in this country, and those uh, trying to create a new green economy uh, to to shift um, a a very damaging course that we're on, particularly here in the United States, is that we're we're trying to solve massive long-term problems. Um, I don't think it's any surprise to to our listeners out there that uh, the current government in the United States, uh, if you go back the last many years, has shown itself time and again totally unable to change course policy-wise and set us on a more sustainable future. Things have been done piecemeal. There have been a couple of efforts. uh, But when it comes to really taking a long-term view and addressing some of the massive environmental challenges we face, I think our country has just not been up to the task. Uh, Why is that? Well, there are a lot of reasons that people can give, and I I don't claim to have the the complete answer by any means. Um, But I think, as as your listeners will well know, um, we have had an energy policy which, for the past many years, has given far more in public subsidies to the traditional polluting industries, the old-fashioned way of coal and uh, certainly oil and gas, Um, We saw in in the recent conclusion of the BP Oil Spill Commission that the regulators were completely not up for the task, totally under-resourced to to protect our uh, our seacoast, the entire Gulf. Um, And so what we need, I I think we can all agree, is uh, a really forward-looking energy policy that is not, as Tom Friedman puts it, the sum of all lobbies. Uh, And a little anecdote, we see... Uh, energy companies, oil, gas, the traditional polluting industry spending about $20 for every $1 uh, 
that folks representing alternative energies and the environment are spending in politics. Uh, that doesn't completely explain it, but I think it is a major factor in why our country has been totally unable to, to address these problems. And, and this community, I think, uh, really gets the need for policy as well as private sector um, forward thinking uh, a totally new direction for our country. Now, 20 to 1 seems like a remarkable ratio to me. Um, but I don't know campaign reform well enough to know how that figure compares to other industries. Say, how does it rank against agriculture or how does it rank against telecom or something like that? Where, where is it on the scale of spending ratios? This is quite anecdotal without really diving into the weeds on, on particular industries, but it's actually kind of consistent with what we tend to see hmm. when you've got a, a particular issue where industry tends to line up on one side and a couple of consumer advocates on the other. Hmm. Um, you take the health care fight, um, pharmaceutical interests were paying about a million bucks per day hmm. throughout 2009 to lobby the government to, to get their desired outcome right. in the health care bill. Consumer advocates maybe spent a couple million over the course of the year. Hmm. Uh, so it's it's not atypical, right. and I think it's something that we should be concerned about. So environmentalists have some some comfort then in knowing they have friends who are being outspent. So it, it's it's not that the they're environment... Not <laughs> they're not alone. <laughs> Good. Small consolation. But um, you also suggest... In, in, you have a couple of reports on your website. One of them that I've, I've focused in on in particular and we're, we'll be showing in the background here on this YouTube clip is uh, a report called Money in Politics and the Environment. Um, you say that incumbents receive 82% of uh, energy industry contributions in 2008. Um, so it seems to me as though you're not only talking about outspending, you're talking about slowing the cogs of change. Yeah. Very much so. I mean, when you look at the way in which this money is given, uh, I think there is a portion of money in politics. And, and I want to be clear, we're not saying all private money is bad. In fact, we're wanting to reform the system through a small donor approach, which broadly expands the base of money and gets citizens uh, making the decisions here, writing the checks, influencing campaigns. But when you look at the energy industry money, and I don't think this is a surprise to anybody, it's not going kind of willy-nilly to, to one candidate here, one there, who, who may happen to take the industry's position. It's going in a really targeted fashion, more than $8 out of 10 to incumbents, but not any old incumbent either. It's going to the heads of the committees dealing with environmental regulation. So the Energy and Commerce Committee, you go down that committee, members of that committee, particularly whatever majority it may be, are getting far more dollars a um, couple times the amount per individual as any old member of the House or Senate is getting. Um, and the chairs in particular, leadership in particular. So they're giving this money, it would seem, uh, with a desired outcome. It's not supporting any ind individual candidates. It's trying to obtain an outcome and, and get some influence in the process. Another thing that you have spoken to me about on your website mentions perhaps sort of indirectly, but I think it's a very powerful message in regards to the environmental lobby. You talk about um, how there is, a, once you get beyond a certain limit or a certain threshold of spending, you have pretty significant diminishing margins of return. Um, there's one or two graphs on your website um, that the curve peaks at about what is it, Dan, about 700000 or something like that? Going to a million dollars, yeah. So what you're talking about is, and some of the campaigns that we've seen have spent in the millions, hundreds of millions, right? So um, the, what you're talking about is the inefficient application of resources. And this is one of the systemic problems that in the environmental movement we try to fix, right? Yeah. That every ounce of what we have, every valuable resource that we have is applied in a way that will achieve a desired outcome. Uh, in campaigns, that doesn't seem to be the case. It's hugely wasteful. And so the, the messages of efficiency here seem to be very much in sympathy with each other. Yeah, uh, I'd argue that we have, in any given election, hundreds of millions of dollars worth, worth of wasted spending. Mm -hmm. And you and I, you know, watching our TV during campaign season, we're getting whacked over the head by these miserable ads, which have nothing to do with substance and are just beating up, slinging mud across the aisle. Um, 
what where this really matters for campaign reform is that uh, under a system that like we're proposing, which is to take small donations, match them with public funds for candidates who agree to only take small donations, not the big money that they're collecting today, mm. is uh, we're not going to guarantee they have the most money. Mm. They will get outspent, and the court has been really clear over the years, you've got a First Amendment right to spend your money. Yeah. Now corporations do too. Um, so we're not going to guarantee they have the most money when they take our small donations and matching public funds, but we will guarantee if they're serious and the public support that they'll have enough. And even if they're outspent, it's, it's remarkable when you look at the last 20 years of House races, if a candidate reaches about a million bucks, the fact that their opponent spends more means almost nothing. The rate of return is, is flat. Now, to play devil's advocate for a second, right? You and I are sitting here in an office space in New York City, right? Who's our mayor, Michael Bloomberg, right? Self-made, I can't even remember what he's made, but more than I'll ever be worth, I'm sure, right? Um, and he spent more than I'll ever be worth simply on his campaign, right? He was effective, right? And New Yorkers, I don't want to say they love him, but he enjoys popular support, right? Mm-hmm. So are there not counterexamples to what you're saying here? You know, I think Mayor Bloomberg is actually a good argument for the kind of reform we're trying to put in place. The great thing about Mayor Bloomberg is by spending his $100 million to get elected and reelected, he is beholden to nobody but himself. And that's what we're getting at. Our only issue is we don't want to only have a situation where billionaires can represent us. Uh, we think there are some other good people in this country who, who could do a fine job as well. So we want that outcome where the candidate is not beholden to whatever industry or, or interest groups but is beholden to themselves and their constituents. So if the Bloombergs have their, their dollars, we say spend away. Let's just be sure that money isn't the only condition for entering. Thus, if, if an opposing candidate can get a lot of small donations, qualifies, we'll match them with public funds, and they can compete as well. Now, we're run, running out of time here, so I just want to ask one or two more questions. Um, I'm wondering what sort of traction you've got in your conversations with environmental nonprofits or those other groups that are being outspent 20 to 1. Are they sympathetic to this message? Are they joining on and helping you? Or do you find that this conversation is the one they don't hear or it's so new to them? Or, you know, what, what's the relationship like there? We're really encouraged um, by the response we're getting from the environmental community. I'd say the conversation is only beginning. We're not at the, at the level of cooperation that we hope to be. Um, but some, some leading environmental groups like the Natural Resources Defense Council, the Sierra Club, the League of Conservation Voters have all endorsed uh, our legislative effort, the Fair Elections Now Act, which would create this small donor public matching system. Um, and increasingly over time, they, they've really committed to, to helping move this forward because uh, they believe that it's a part of, of meeting the long-term needs that, that they are leading and that so many of us recognize have to be met. Um, so we're encouraged, but frankly, we need much more. We're looking for much more uh, leadership from, from this community, not just the, the green advocates, but the professionals too. Um, and, and so that's why I'm so glad to be speaking to this group um, in hopes that we can really work together on these big long-term problems that we face. Well, Dan... I think that's about all the time we have today, but I wanted to thank you for coming in and speaking with us. Thanks so much. That was Ben Carmichael speaking with Daniel Weeks. For more, go to 2DegreesNetwork.com or follow us on Twitter at 2DegreesNetwork.